Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Gabriela Marota, Academic Director at Aticana BNC in Tucumán, Argentina. Welcome to the Teaching Capacity Building Program 2021. We started this professional development program for EFL teachers last year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. A year of learning and growth has gone by, and now, more than ever, teachers all over the world are working together focusing on building resilience and embracing the challenges in education. That is why, just like in 2020, three binational centers in Argentina are hosting the Teaching Capacity Building 2021 program. Icana from Cordoba, Isicana from Salta, and Atikana from Tucumán. The program consists of a series of 15 webinars delivered by a group of committed and very hardworking English teachers who are all alumni of US embassy sponsored programs. They are gener generously sharing their expertise and best practices during these challenging times to help EFL teachers in their current teaching practice whether it is virtual, in person, or hybrid. Our deepest thanks to all the alumni presenters and the US Embassy for their help in the organization and delivery of this program. A very special thanks to you, Nori Serda, coordinator at the Public Affairs Section of the Embassy of the United States in Buenos Aires, and to Giselle Dubinsky. Thank you to Eleonora Salas, Academic Director at ICANA, Cordoba. Hello, Eleonora, thank you. And thank you to Claudia Corimajo, Academic Director at ICANA, Salta. Hello, Claudia, how are you? Before I introduce our presenter for today, I have a few announcements to make. Please type your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen, because we might have time at the end of the webinar to answer, to answer them. And there is a link to download your certificate of attendance, and the, that link will be posted in the chat section. And now I'm going to talk about our, our presenter, Alba Carolina Rioja was graduated as a teacher of English in 2001 at Profesorado Superior de Lenguas Vivas in Salta. And she obtained her university degree in 2013 at Universidad Caese. In 2014, she attended an online course on ESP best practices offered by the University of Oregon and sponsored by the US Embassy. In 2017, Alba was granted a Fulbright scholarship to be part of the Teaching Excellence and Achievement Program in the US, where she attended a series of customized professional development courses at Appalachian State University. 2017, uh, Fundación Luminis granted her a scholarship as part of its Formador de Formadores program. She attended the postgraduate specialization in special didactics at Universidad Nacional de Córdoba. Her webinar of today is called A Closer Look at Visual Literacy in ELT, Colors and Works of Art. And um, Alba, I'm okay. passing it hey. over to you. Okay. Thanks, Gabriela, for the presentation. And first of all, I would like to send the US Embassy, ICANA, ICANA and ICANA uh, for, uh, for forming part of this uh, great program, Teaching Capacity Building. And welcome everybody to this workshop called Visual Literacy. And I'm going to share my screen, the presentation. Okay, can you see it? Okay, there it is. And so my presentation is about literacy, visual literacy in English language teaching. And today we are going to focus on colors and works of art. These are the topics of my presentation. We are going to deal with visual literacy, 
what visual literacy is within the frameworks of multimodality and multiliteracies. And after that, we are going to work with some strategies on how to work with colors from the psychological and from the cultural point of views. And after that, we are going to work with different models for analyzing works of art. And these are some of the strategies that we are going to work with. And I would like to uh, be active in this uh, workshop because I would like you to participate in some of these activities, some, some of these activities that I'm going to propose. We are going to work with uh, these uh, strategies, visual thinking strategies, the three dimensions of viewing, the syntax and semantics of an image, and the color symbol and image strategy. Okay, so uh, as you know, we are bombarded by images everywhere. Our students are bombarded by images they use, and we use social media every day. And the experts call this generation the visual generation. And some other experts call it the generation Z, the selfie generation, the generation like, the internet generation, the iGen, and the Google generation. So um, I think that it's important that we know about visual literacy and how we can foster visual literacy in our English uh, classes. So let's see Apcon's uh, quotation here. Um, literacy is the ability to express oneself in an effective way through the text of the moment. The prevailing mode of expression in a particular society. To be literate, in other words, is to be conversant in the dominant expressive language and form of the age. So if we reflect on the language, on the mode of communication that prevails nowadays, uh, I think that we agree that it's the visual mode of communication. That's why I think that we should uh, try to include different types of texts in our classes. And uh, we know that some modes of communication are combined with other modes of communication. That's why we can talk about multimodality. And multimodal texts uh, combine different modes of communication visual, the oral mode, the linguistic, the spatial, and the gestural mode. Uh, this model was uh, developed by the new London group in the 90s. Okay, let's see. I want to show you some examples of multimodal texts. And you will notice that we already worked, worked with some of these texts, but the, um, what I want in these uh, webinars is to raise awareness on how to work with these multimodal texts and to work towards uh, the, the development of visual literacy and also towards the development of critical thinking skills and at the same time, linguistic skills. Okay, this is a kind of multimodal text. This is a concept map and uh, this text combines the visual and the spatial and the textual mode of communication. Here we have an infographic. It also combines the visual, the textual, the spatial and a, a website. A website combines many other modes of communication, the oral, the textual, the linguistic, the visual, the interactive sometimes, the, and it, some websites use virtual reality. And also dance and drama plays, they are also multimodal texts because they combine different modes, the oral, the spatial, the visual, and of course, video games. Our uh, students are used to using video games, maps or graphs, and picture books and graphic novels. I didn't include here graphic novels, but I think that we should also include different types of texts, not only textual texts, but also texts that combine pictures and uh, ling the linguistic mode of communication, and also graphs. And today we're going to work with some special types of graphs. Okay, so let's start with, and also videos, of course. Okay, let's, um, let's see this definition of visual literacy. In the context of human intentional visual communication, visual literacy refers to a group of largely acquired abilities. That is to say, the abilities to understand, to read, and to use or write images, as well as to think and learn in terms of images. 
And I would like to draw your attention towards the, this part of the concept of visual literacy to the read and write images. It means that we have to learn to read images, to interpret, to analyze images, and also to produce or to write images. Okay, let's start with the first topic that I would like to deal with, colors. Okay, so apart from working with colors in different ways that we are used to doing in our, cl in our classes, such as working with a vocabulary related to, to colors or idiomatic expressions, we can also include uh, colors uh, when working with advertisements, with logos, with corporate logos, with TV spots or film clips. And let's see some examples. I'm going to show you some examples of logos. And you're going to tell me in the chat, as I have told you, I want you to participate. Okay. Look at this one. Yes, this is a very famous logo, McDonald's logo. Uh, what types of uh, modes of uh, communication does it combine? Mm -hmm. How many types? Can you write in the chat? Okay, the visual also, the visual, good. But you also have, yes, McDonald's. Okay, the visual, okay. Don't you think that um, this logo also combines the textual mode? Okay, visual and textual, good. And the color, okay, what about the colors? Why do you think that uh, this uh, company chose red and yellow. What do you think about these colors? Okay, the spatial. Striking, okay, they are striking colors. Okay, thanks, Mona, Mona Lee. Okay, yes, they are striking, very bright colors. Do they call your attention? Yes, okay, they are warm colors. Yes, you're right, Ursula. Yes, okay, let's see uh, why McDonald's chose these colors. Okay, uh, so red, it says here red, uh, it is used to increase appetite and to increase the sense of urgency so that customers yes, feel in a hurry and they eat and they go away rapidly. Okay, good, yellow is also the color of cheeriness and optimism. And also these colors are appealing to children. And you are going, I'm going to share all the materials, the presentation, everything at the end of, the at the end of this webinar uh, through a Padlet. So uh, don't worry because uh, I'm going to share the link. Yes, there is a link here where you're going to find all the meanings of colors and a nice infographic that has these uh, logos that you can use in your classes. Hey, let's explore another logo. I think that you, I think that some of you would love this place, Starbucks logo. What do you think about that? Look at the logo carefully. Um, what is the image that you can see there? What do you see? Have you ever stopped to observe closely the logo, Starbucks logo? A mermaid, yes, very good. It's a mermaid, very good. And why do you think that they chose a mermaid? Okay, yes, it's a mermaid. Why do you think that they chose a mermaid? What do you think that it represents? Okay, yes, a mythical, it's a mythical um, character. Yes, and okay, to all your customers. And why green, why green? Why do you think that they chose green? Green, is, okay, relaxing. Green is related to relaxing, yes. 
Okay, to create a nice atmosphere. Okay, let's see the explanation here in this infographic. Nature, very good, Carolina. Yes, nature, it's related to nature. They chose the mermaid, the mermaid, uh, because it says here that it stimulates the customers' associations with nature. Hmm? And using green promotes a sense of relaxation, inviting customers to take a coffee break and de-stress. Okay, good. Okay, good guesses. Very good. Thanks for your participation. And it says here that it's the only top global brand which uses green as its primary color. Okay, so in the website, you are going to find more information about colors and how to include them. Whenever you deal with a unit that is uh, that deals with advertisements, advertising. Okay, so you can include this activity. Okay, let's continue with colors um, and the cultural meanings of colors. Um, look at the, the picture there. Who is he? An angry bird, okay, and it's red. And tell me, what, what's the meaning of red? What does red represent in our culture, in our Western culture? And I see that there are participants uh, from other countries. So I think that I uh, read that someone was from India. What does uh, red represent in India or in other parts of the world for us? What, and for us, what's, okay, passion, annoyance, strong emotions, right, danger, rule. Okay, good. Yes, red represents anger. Okay, fury, good. Okay, red danger, warning. Okay, it's the same here. It represents that. Okay, so in Western countries, red represents love, passion, anger, energy, and warning. And uh, according to uh, the web page, to the sources that I consulted, in Eastern countries, it represents prosperity, and good fortune. So colors represent different things in different parts of the world. It says here that in India it represents fertility. Okay, let's look at the other color, blue. What does it represent in our culture, this color? Okay, sadness, it's a cool color, you're right. Yes, I agree with you. It represents sadness, loneliness. Okay, good. So I agree with you. And uh, in our culture, it represents sadness, depression, also authority, trust, peace, calm. And it's the masculine color. Sensitivity, someone wrote they are very good. And in the Eastern cultures, it represents immortality and it's a feminine color. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how can we uh, implement this, uh, the meaning, the cultural meanings of colors in our classes? Uh, this is an idea. Mm -hmm. These are some activities that you can do in your classes. For example, you can divide students into color groups or continent groups and assign them uh, certain colors and they have to find out what that color mean, that color means in those cultures. Or you can also make them look at all the colors in one region and then present that information in a colorful way. So that's just an idea that you can implement or, and you are going to find that in this link. Okay, you can also, if you work with children, uh, I also suggest that you use picture books, uh, especially this one. This one is a very nice picture book that deals with emotions and colors, the connection that you can make between colors and emotion. The, this picture book is called The Color Monster. And in this story, there is a monster who changes its color according to the way he feels. Sometimes he is red because he is hungry. Sometimes he is yellow, he's green. And at the end of the story, here I pasted the end of the story, uh, he is pink. Why do you think that he's pink? He turns pink.
Okay, love. Yes, it seems that he uh, falls in love or friendship. Yes, I agree with you. Comfort, good. Okay, I uh, suggest that if you work with children, you look for this book because it's great to work with emotions and colors. And there are many, many resources about this. Okay, uh, there's another. Okay, I want to show you another picture from another picture book. Um, this is called Little Beauty, and it was written by Anthony Brown, uh, an English, um, a British writer. And he, I included this picture where the gorilla uh, turns angry. And the picture is red. So you can make the students infer why the page is red, why the gorilla is red there. And the words, how the words, how the text is arranged in the page. Okay, here we have another example from another picture book. Uh, this is, these pictures were taken from Gorilla by Anthony Brown. And uh, this is a story of Hannah a little girl whose father doesn't have much time to spend with her. And he is at, she is at the same time a keen on gorillas. And she has a gorilla puppet. And this gorilla puppet turns into, a, comes alive a one night. And here you can see two different pictures. And look at the colors. What do you see? What do you notice in those two pictures? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, you can see her face. Okay. With the gorilla, the colors are warmer. Yes, and with that cooler and cooler and the blue picture represents sadness. Very good. So in that way you can uh, implement the colors the interpretation of colors in the class and make them make students aware of the differences between these two pictures. Why the artist uh, chose to use warm colors or bright colors and cool colors in one picture, where, for example, Hannah, uh, look at the distance, the proximity. Yes, the father seems to be very far from Hannah. And in, on the other hand, on uh, when Hannah is having breakfast with the gorilla, she's much closer, okay? Okay, nice, nice interpretations, okay? The blue color may represent a sad home. Yes, very good, very good. Okay, thanks, thanks for participating. Nice use of a space, right, very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's continue. So we uh, finish with colors, you have some ideas to work with the psychology of colors and the cultural meanings of colors. Now we're going to turn to another type of image. Okay, look at this. Look at this. Uh, I wrote here as a title, Science in Disguise. And look, look at the picture carefully and write. What do you notice? And what do you wonder? Okay. What do you notice here? Okay, points, right? I notice a glacier. I wonder what's behind it. Okay, thank you. Mountains, okay, Mona Lee, thank you. There's a graphic, Gabriela. Yes, you're right. There's a graphic. I really like it. Blue does not look like something sad at all there. Okay, good. And there are points. And what do you think that this image represent, represents? What do you think?
Okay, there is a graph. Yeah, this is actually a graph. Mm -hmm. This is a graph. And this graph was made by Jill Pelto. And it represents the melting of glaciers throughout 1984 and 2014. Uh, Jill is an artist and also a scientist. So she uh, mixes his two, her two passions and he creates graphs, but in, uh, in the form of pictures, nice pictures, okay, works of art. Okay, so let's look at another. Okay, and this is, these are the questions that you can make, uh, answer your students. Uh, and uh, this activity, I took this strategy from a section from the New York Times that is called, what's going on in this graph? And you have to make students look at the graphs closely uh, and, you, and they have to answer these questions. What do you notice? What do you wonder? What are you curious about from what you notice in the graph? What might be going on in this graph? And write a catchy headline that captures the graph's main idea. And um, I recommend that you go to this page and browse this page because uh, they, the, this section publishes a different graph uh, weekly. And students can participate in forums and they participate and they can interact with other students from other parts of the world. And uh, at the end of the week, they reveal the answer. So it's interesting, it's motivating for them. Uh, okay, I will show you another graph. Okay, look at this one. What do you think that it represents? Smoke, okay, it's a fire, fire. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Deforestation. Very good. Yes, it represents. It's a graph that represents that. Okay, let's see. The, this is the actual graph, and it, re, it represents how global warming increased since 1880, 1880 and 2014. Okay, so let's look at another. This one is my favorite. Okay, what do you see? What do you see in this graph? A tiger in a forest, okay. Mm -hmm. The consequences, extinct animals, yes, like a tiger hiding. Okay, very good, very good. So the decrease in the number of animals, very good. It represents extinction, very good. So this is a line graph and is based on the decline in tiger habitat area from 1970 to 2010. Okay, good. I love this picture because uh, Jill, Jill Pelto, uh, she combines art with science and we can work with, whenever we work with the environment, we can include these types of graphs. And in the panel that I'm going to share, you have the link to, to her page and you have many other graphs with their uh, explanations. Okay, good. So let's continue uh, with images on canvas. Okay, so now we are going to work with other types of works of art. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's think about the advantages of working with works of art. Uh, they may foster affectivity because they may foster motivation and involvement, and uh, they can increase under students' understanding of the context and other realities from other cultures. And they can have direct access to the understanding of cultural symbols and they can help students develop their analytical skills, of course, their visual literacy. And they, they, because 
students are going to give different opinions, they have to become tolerant to those different perspectives. And uh, so how to use works of art. Uh, you may implement special projects or you may work with cross curricular projects. You may work together with the art teacher in your schools or whenever you want to deal with social justice or with topics that are related to poverty, bullying, disability, human rights, and there's a picture for everything. And there is a web page that's called uh, WikiArt, and I'm going to share that, um, that web page with you because there you have different types of works of art divided into different schools, and you have all the explanations of the all the information related to those works of art. And so our aim to work with works of art would be to connect the aesthetic component and social awareness. So let's start with uh, some strategies that I chose to show you today. These are called artful thinking strategies. And look at the picture that I have here. Um, so this is a picture made by Pablo Picasso in his blue period. And this painting is called Beggars by the Sea. Uh, with this type of uh, images, you can use many strategies, but I chose this one that it's called beginning, middle, and end. Uh, so you can make students think that if this image is from the beginning of the story, what happens next? If this is the middle of the story, what happens before and after? And if this is the end of the story, what led to this point? That way you can work with storytelling, uh, with a simple past, past perfect or simple present, it depends. So you can include works of art in this way. And also include the use of colors hmm? because this, this, is, uh, this, ha this painting has different uh, colors, hue colors, okay. So let's continue with another strategy and I want you to participate in this one. Okay, this strategy is called, I see, I wonder, I think. And um, it's interesting because you have first, when you present the images to the students, you have to uh, let them observe the image for some minutes. And after that, you have to ask them what they see uh, what they wonder because they have to ask themselves and they have to know that after I wonder or you have to let them know or give them sentence frames in order to know how to write the sentence in the correct way. I wonder how, I wonder why, I wonder what and then they have to complete the I think sentence and you can also make them join the sentences when they say, I see this, uh, which makes me wonder why or how. And you can also make them join the sentence, I wonder why, because I think that this is like this. Okay. So you can make them work with the sentences in isolated, in isolation, or you can make them join the sentences. It depends on the level of the student. So you're going to use this strategy now with this picture. Look at this. So write in the chat your ideas. I see, I wonder, and I think. What do you see? What do you wonder? Okay, Silvina, I see two friends sharing a good time. Okay, great, friend. I see they are friends. I see two friends, okay. What about the colors? I see two friends, very good. What about the colors? Why did the artist choose uh, yellow and orange. I wonder how long they have known one another. Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. 
cheerful colors, orange is related to transformation. Okay, yes, you're right. I see two friends hanging. I wonder if they are celebrating an achievement. Okay, so in this way, you can make them uh, create other images. You can make students imagine or connect ideas. You see an image that transmits happiness. Okay, the image related to feelings, very good, warm colors. They uh, may have met after long. Okay, very good. I see an image that transmits happiness. They haven't seen each other for a long time. Excellent. Okay, good. Thank you for your participation. So this is a um, picture made by Kate Herring. That's the name of the, uh, of the picture and is called uh, Best Bodies. And it was made in 1990. Okay, and I want to show you the, the, I made this activity with my students, with my B1 students. And also, I don't know if you can see my chat because I'm, I have the chat open, but I don't know if you can, if that disturbs the, 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 the viewing of the full screen. Okay, uh, so I uh, work with this activity in an online class and I use Jamboard. Um, if you don't know about this tool, this is a very useful tool. It's a collaborative tool that you can use in online classes and also in face-to-face -face classes. But I find that uh, this is a good tool for uh, online classes and you create the Jamboard. You can create multiple Jamboards for different groups or for different pictures or different questions or for any activity that you want to uh, do. And I use the same pictures that I uh, use with you. And um, I made them, I include the, included this activity when working with the passive voice. And that was just excuse to include these pictures. And I wrote the name or the title of the picture and I made them um, investigate who painted that picture. And uh, we can see there are some students' responses. I see two buddies having a great time. I think that painting represents the affection and friendship between two people. I wonder why the artist decided to, those, to use those colors and a simple drawing style. Yes, because it's very simple. I think that those friends are laughing. Okay, I like that, I, uh, that opinion because you cannot see their faces, but this student, this student imagined the faces of these uh, two friends. And I also worked with, I want to share another example. And I included, uh, I chose Guernica painted by Pablo Picasso and these are some of students' opinions about this picture. I see a person carrying a kit. I think Guernica was painted by Picasso. I wonder if a woman is burning on the right side of the paint. I see in the picture a lot of body parts, like if there were a distraction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So according to the colors, to the images, to the forms, they see they can infer the meaning and you can also work with the context of the paintings. You can also make them uh, relate the paintings with some historical events. Okay. So now we're going to learn about another strategy that you can use in your classes whenever working, when you work with images. This is called the three dimensions of viewing. And uh, this model is adapted from Kahlo and Serafini, and you can find this in Goldstein. And you have this resource, Goldstein's uh, handbook, in the PubNet that I'm going to share. And um, the three dimensions of viewing deal with different uh, aspects of images, with the affective and perceptual dimension, the compositional and structural, the critical and the, oh, sorry. Uh, the critical uh, thinking 
mode. And here you have a picture where you have different questions related to these three different dimensions. And we're going to try some of them with the picture that I'm going to show you now. Okay, with this one. I chose, in this case, Antonio, uh, Antonio Bernie's painting. This is an Argentinian painter. And this is called Manifestación or Demonstration. And it is from 1934. Uh, so I chose these three questions. The first one relates to the first dimension, the perceptual and affective. How does the image make you feel? The second one is related to the structure, the composition of the image, what text accompanies the image, what does it add to the image? And the third one is related to the critical uh, dimension. What message does the image transmit? So I would like to... I uh, would like you to write ideas or answers to some of these questions. A struggle, okay. How does the image make you feel? It appeals to the emotions, to reflecting on emotions. And what text accompanies the image? It makes me feel anguish, okay. Oppression, okay, thank you. A little bit sad, protest. Pani trabajo, yes, that is the text that accompanies, yes. So here we have two different modes of communication combined. Pani trabajo, yes, that's bread and uh, work, okay, for the ones who don't know Spanish. Uh, okay, and what do you think that this, uh, what's the message of the picture? What do you think? Let's fight together, okay. They want to be heard, yes, very good. Mm -hmm. There are many people. Together we can make a difference. Unity and need. There's poverty and scarcity. Very good. Okay, so this is the social problem. This picture is related to social problems. Yes, different emotions. Okay, they need to have jobs. Very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's explore another picture and a. This is a picture also for, uh, from Antonio Berni, and this picture is from 1978, and it's called Juanito Ciruja. And I chose these uh, questions from the framework of the three dimensions of viewing. Uh, the first one is related to the perceptual dimension. What other images come to your mind when you see it? And the second and the third are related to the compositional and the structure of the image. What elements can you see in the background and foreground? What do you think lies beyond the frame? Who created it? And the last one is related to the critical. Who created it and for what purpose and in which context? Okay, poverty, very good. Yes, it's related to poverty. And look at the picture and it makes use of a special technique. Hmm. Recycling, yes, it's related to recycling, sadness, very good. And collage, yes, it uses the collage um, technique. And I like this question, the third question, what do you think lies beyond the frames? Because it makes you imagine what's beyond the picture. Hmm? I think it's interesting. And look at the sky. The sky is not blue. Okay, he seems to use gloves to pick up rubbish. Very good. Mm -hmm. Sizes, very good. Okay. Uh, I decided uh, to include these type, types of pictures because we are dealing with the, uh, with topics related to social awareness. 
but you can use any other types of pictures in your classes. And but you can adapt the strategies. That's the important thing. Again, sociological, sociological issues. Very good. You can adapt the activities to any pictures that you use in class. Okay, and the last strategy. Uh, oh no, I think that it's not the last, but it's almost the last one. Uh, so this is about the syntax and semantics of an image. Remember the definition about visual literacy? I highlighted the read and write images phrase. Uh, so it means that visual, that images have a grammar, a special grammar. They have a visual grammar. Uh, there is a very well-known author uh, that deals with multimodality um, who is called Gunther Kress, and he deals with the visual grammar of images. And if you deal with the syntax of the image, we are going to deal with the graphic composition, with the colors, with the perspective, with the position of the objects, with the colors. And uh, if we deal with the semantics of an image, we are going to deal with the underlying assumptions, the values, the context, the relation of the image with the external world, so with the meaning. And the syntax has to do with the structure of the image. And here you have some practical questions that you can use to work with the images to work with the syntactical analysis and semantic analysis. For example, and you can also use these types of questions with films and also with photographs, because you have this question, how was the camera placed? What's the focus of the camera? That's important. And uh, I, here I included another colorful picture of, uh, painted by Kate Herring. This is called Computer Brain. And these are the questions that I chose for this image. What is the most important element? What does the color palette say about the image? Who created this image? In what context was it created? And what does this image say uh, about the culture? Okay. So I think that this image is thought provoking. It is from 1989, so it is related to the context. And look at the type of computer that this creature has in his hand. So it, you can foster a lot of discussion and promote a lot of discussion in your classes through pictures, I think. Okay, and I, I'm going to show you very quickly, the last activity, the last strategy that's called color symbol image. And you can work with this routine after students have read a passage from a book, a short story, a poem, or watch a short film. Uh, you have to, after reading a book or watched a film, you can make students choose a color that represents ideas in the book, uh, you have to make them choose a symbol that represents the ideas or the events that you have in the book and an image that explain, and they have to explain why. I'm going to show you some examples very quickly. Um, after making my B1 level students uh, read The Street Lawyer and, uh, by Sean, John Grisham, uh, this is one example. Uh, this student chose the image of a homeless or a person giving something to a homeless man. And he, she wrote here, I chose this image because in the story, the main character lives behind his luxurious life to help homeless people who are being Ill illegally evicted. And the color, uh, this student chose blue because it represents freedom, justice, perseverance. And those are the main ideas of the book. And uh, the symbol that she chose uh, was a gavel, the hammer that the special hammer that judges use, that's called gavel. I chose this symbol because the entire story centers around justice. And let's see another nice example. This is a scale. Yellow represents the lawyer's hope for his success in life, in his job. Despite all the prejudices about this profession, blue means security or support. The money is blue. Yes, look at the symbol of the money. 
uh, the money gives him economic support, the heart is red, the love for his job and helping people, and the image is about justice is balanced, a typical lawyer's symbol. Okay, nice. So in that way, you can foster critical thinking skills after reading a book, for example, or a short story. And this is the last example that I'm going to show you. And uh, in this case, this student chose brown. I chose brown because after researching colors meaning, brown is what represented the legal, and I think it's what represents the street lawyer as well. It's a color which represents honesty and sincerity. I chose this famous human rights symbol because I think that in the book, we treat this topic very much showing how homeless rights are human rights and how Michael is doing something for a change. And this image, in my opinion, uh, this student also chose a homeless uh, girl. It's the most accurate for me because basically it's describing not only the book situation, but today's reality situation and how nobody is there for the homeless people. I left some student mistakes, okay, but they, uh, they really communicate what they are thinking. Okay, so. Okay, this is another a very funny picture, but I'm going to share the picture, the, everything here, so you can uh, browse the and look at the pictures carefully and look for the resources. Okay, and this is the, uh, the QR code, you can scan the code and Gabriela is going to share the link of the Padlet where you're going to find all the resources. The workshop Padlet, the workshop handout. And uh, I also remind you that she, Gabriela is going to share the link to get the certificate of attendance, okay? So thank you very much for being here, for participating in this webinar. Okay, and I would like to know if there are any questions. I can't see any in the Q&A section, but I think everybody is really, was really amazed and followed your lesson. I think it was wonderful talking about oh, colors sure. and how that relates to, to our feelings and to so many things, really. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone. Alba, we want to thank you, Alba. It was really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank you so, so much for, for, uh, for talking about such an interesting topic. Um, okay. I want to thank you all to our audience. And um, I want to thank the embassy again for their support. And uh, we would like to invite you all to register to our next teaching capacity building webinar, which will which will be next Friday uh, in a week. So thank you, thank you so much. Okay. okay. Yes, uh, Gabriela, uh, I think that I don't know if you have already shared the link for the yes. certificate. Oh, okay. Yes, I, okay. No, the certificates. Okay. No, I don't know. Uh, sorry, I didn't. I think that uh, only the Padlets link. Yes. Yes, Sergio is going to share the, the certificate. Ah, okay. 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 Thanks, everyone, and thanks for Thank your you comment. Much. Okay, and we'll see you next week then. Bye bye. Okay. See you. Bye. -bye. Thanks, everyone.